to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center podcast. We hope that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a word from Pastor Jen Cobray. I'm going to get down my knees and pray. Come on, stand to your feet. Let's go before the Lord. Father, we just come to you in the name of Jesus, giving you all the praise, all the glory, all the honor. We thank you, Father, for a mighty move of your spirit in our hearts and our lives tonight, Lord. Wake us up. Fill us with your way, your word, your want, your desire, your will. Holy Spirit, we know you're the teacher of the church. So welcome into this house, into our hearts. Here's our hearts. Fill it with you. We'll give you the praise and glory and the honor. We haven't come to hear from a man. We haven't come, we never will, to hear from a woman. We've come to hear from the teacher of the church, the Holy Spirit. Welcome, Holy Spirit. Build us, encourage us, guide us, and guard us. Direct us and motivate us to be all that you would have us to be. And Lord, we'll give you the praise, glory, and all of the honor. How good it is to be in the house of the Lord. Now, Lord, we want you to bless all the churches in the Inland Empire, as well as around the planet that are preaching and hearing the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Bless our Baptist brothers and Lutherans and Methodists, Episcopalian, Charismatics, Pentecostals, Calvary Chapels and Harvest, Oak Valley and Oasis and Inland Christian Center, Lord. The Assemblies of God, four square denomination. Father, we thank you for our Adventist brothers and Catholic brothers, Trinity and Emmanuel Baptist, and we thank you for Ecclesia Church and San Bernardino Temple, Lord. At no time do we think of ourselves as better than them, but we see ourselves as co-laborers, workers together in one field, building one kingdom, yours, God, not a man's. And God will give you the praise, give you the glory, as the Spirit of God falls upon this place and theirs also. Jesus, mighty name, with a great big shout, we're all in agreement, and we say amen. amen. Tonight I want to take you someplace that God's been taking me lately. Before I tell you the title of the message, I'll, so that you can make notes, I just want to mention a few things to you. got a lot of verses, going to put them up on the overhead. I'd like you to start bringing your Bible to church. If you don't have a Bible, we'll get you one free. If you can't afford it, if you can afford it, don't give me this, you want it free. Well, I'm going to smack you in the head with it if, you, if that's the way you are. So get a Bible and get to church with your Bible so that you can learn what the Word of God has to say because you should be in an attitude that you're saying, I don't care what men say, I want to know what God says. And so the only way to do that is to check out the Word of the Lord. Every time you walk through the doors, you have a Bible in your hand. I'm going to encourage you to do that. Meantime, we're going to put the verses on the overhead so you don't miss the Word of God tonight and you can stay tuned in to what God is saying. Recently, I heard someone talking about a great sports figure and this great sports figure made a statement. He said it's 80% attitude and 20% talent. I've heard that all of my life, being an ex-professional baseball player. For those that you don't know this, I, when I was young, that was like 300 or 400 years ago. <laughs> when I was young, I played with a team called the Kansas City Athletics. You know them better as the Oakland Athletics. That shows how old I am. Yes, they had uniforms in those days. <laughs> and um, I played with the Oakland Athletics and their minor league teams professional baseball for three years. There was a, something that went on all the time. It was called attitude. People with attitude, it was amazing, always went further than people that had talent. I kind of love that idea because if it's really 80% attitude and 20% talent, I've got 20% of some kind of talent. The problem with it is, is because my talents is so limited, I don't have the attitude of 80%. My roommate who pitched in rotation behind me in the minor leagues, that means pitched in rotation. I was like the third starter. There was five starters on a ball team. I was like third, and he was fifth. He had an attitude. That meant because he is fifth, he didn't have the stuff that the first, second, third, fourth starter 
had. He didn't have the good fastball, didn't have a good curveball, didn't have any of that good stuff. He was just okay. Never expected him to ever make it to the major leagues. The guy was just not filled with much talent. He was one of those 20% talent guys, but had 120% attitude. Cocky, arrogant, just a punk. Ends up going to the major leagues. I'm rejected. And he ends up in the Hall of Fame. I won't mention his name because who knows? You know, he might, he's from around this area. Ends up as a, one of the greatest relief pitchers in the history of baseball. You gotta be kidding me. Attitude sometimes takes you further than you think. And sometimes we've got to get a picture of this. And that's why tonight, the title of the message will help you identify something for your future. Now we're talking about the year of 2012. You might as well be successful in it. But God went to the cross so that you would be successful. Why be a failure? God doesn't want you to be a failure. God doesn't want you to be a loser. God doesn't want you at the end of 2012 having a lousy year like you had in 2011. God wants to prosper you. God wants to be, you'd have to be stupid not to read your Bible and find out that God wants to prosper you in every area of your life. Then why is it? that a lot of people never get prosperous in the areas of their life, their marriage, their job, their finances, their dreams, their vision, their children, their destiny. Why is it that they're not as successful as God wants them to be? I really believe it's because we have something to contribute. We have 20% of ourselves talent and 80% of a bad attitude instead of a godly attitude. And that's why I call this 80-20 a Christian's attitude for victory. If I'm going to face this year of 2012, I want to face this year knowing some of the biblical principles of men and women that have gone before us in the Bible that tell us about how to have that attitude that we need to have, that 80% attitude, even though we only have maybe 20% giftings to put in. For some of you, let me tell you something, with God you've been taught this and it's wrong. You've been taught it's 100% God and you don't do anything. God doesn't care about your works, that's a lie. The Bible makes it very clear that God says, uh, he says, show me your faith and I'll show you my works. I'll show you my faith by my works. In other words, you're going to have to believe God to the place of putting something in. It might only be 20%, it might be 2%, it might be 5%, but whatever you put in, the other part, the attitude part, ought to be a Christian attitude towards victory because God's already gone to the cross and paid the price for you to be successful. So I tell you, for every one of us that are in here, you may not have been the best student in the world. You may not have been the smartest person in the world. You may not have been the prettiest person around town. You may have not have been the quickest person around town. But you could put 20% of yourself into something and then take a godly attitude of 80% and mix it together, you and God together. My Bible says all things are possible to him that believes. And you mix it together and you've now come out and here at the end of the year of 2012, you're going to have a greater job and more successful and happier marriage and, and better children and life going on with hope in your heart for tomorrow because you got a great God on the throne today. And so for all of us that are in here, we can do this. If I come to you tonight and say, you know what, in order for you to be successful, it's going to take 100% of all of your ability and talent. Most of you have dropped out right there. But I'm not saying that. You've got some ability. I don't know what the amount is. You've got some talent. I don't know how much it is. It might only be 1% or 2%. But if you have a godly attitude, which makes up the difference, that means bringing God into the scene, oh, you can't do anything but be successful. I took that principle in ministry. I said, God, I'm not the smartest guy in town. You know, I'm not the guy that's got all the degrees. The one thing I've got, God, is I've got an attitude. I've got a God behind me that cannot fail. And if I've got a God behind me that cannot fail, then if I believe in him and incorporate him in what I'm doing, you didn't hear what I just said. If I believe in him and incorporate in him in what I'm doing, one more time. If I believe in him and incorporate him in what I'm doing, I can't fail. So he becomes my 80%. 
And I become whatever percent I can contribute with my whole heart. Is anybody listening? Yeah. To have that correct attitude for victory. Is anybody listening? Yeah. Five things God gave me to give to you. Five simple things for a godly attitude that will make up the difference where your ability stops. Is that cool? Yeah. Five things you and I need to look at. In order for us to be successful and have this Christian attitude for victory, if you will call it that, we're going to have to be number one secure. You're going to have to know who holds you. You're going to have to know where you're at. You're going to have to understand and be fully confident in the connection that you have with God. Not this world, not your ability, not your checkbook, not your finances, not your educational system, not the degrees that you have. How secure are you based on who he is and your relationship with him? Because I found that people that are secure start off right. People that are insecure, man, the first wind that blows is going to blow you away. First problem that comes, first trouble that comes, going to take you out. You're going to have to come to a place, every one of us are going to see this, so am I, and the place is so that I am secure in Christ Jesus. There's nobody going to remove me from his hand. I am in his grip. I tell you what, nobody's going to take away the Jesus that I am held on to by him. I'm there with him. And without that kind of an attitude, boy, we, we, we live in a world of fear. And fear shows whether or not you're secure or not secure. Fear is the barometer as to whether or not you're secure or not secure. In fact, listen to the word of God. I'll just pop it up on the overhead. Psalms 91, verse number 5. You shall not be afraid for the terror by night nor the arrow that flies by day. In other words, a terror by night, you don't know what's coming, when it's coming, how it's coming. The arrow that flies by day, you don't even realize it's coming, it's there. All of a sudden, you're going in a different direction. Here comes an arrow. You don't know how it's going to work. Why are you afraid of anything? When you are afraid, you are not secure. The, the root of, of insecurity is fear. Listen to what the Word of God says in Hebrews 13th chapter. You've got your Bible? Hebrews 13, chapter, verse number 6 says it like this. So we may boldly say that the Lord is my helper. Now I will not what fear. What can man do to me? The Lord is my helper. I'm secure in him. I don't have any money. I don't have any education. I'm not very pretty. I'm not very smart. I'm not very talented. I don't have anything, but I've got an attitude because I am secure in him. And if you're going to get to me, you're going to have to go through him to get to me. Are you following me? Now we're talking about a victory. We're talking about an attitude of a Christian that's going to bring us to a place of victory. Very important for us to make these kinds of understandings that, that the Lord is our helper and and I will not fear. Let me tell you something. If you really want to check yourself out and whether or not you're secure or not. Now, this is really important. If there is a barometer or some kind of measuring instrument that would tell you if you're secure or not secure, it's in the Bible, and I'll tell you what it is. Because here's why. So many people say they are secure when they're insecure. It is the positive thing to say, I'm secure. Deep down inside, you're insecure. Now, wouldn't there be something if you could just measure your insecurity position? There is. Did you know the Bible tells you how to do that? All you have to do is go with me to Proverbs in the third chapter. When you get to Proverbs, the third chapter, you look at verse 24, and it tells you something about a little barometer that's on the inside of you tells you how secure you are and how secure you're not. In verse number 24, let's pop it up on the overhead. Let's check it out. When you lie down, you will not be afraid. Yes, you will lie down and your sleep will be sweet. If your sleep is not sweet, you're insecure. You're worried. You're frustrated. You're not sure how the outcome is. You haven't gotten behind 
your security. You're not in his grip. You're looking for something else. We got real quiet in here. Sometimes we don't want to be exposed where we're at. Sometimes we don't really want to hear the way it is. We want to hear that we're okay. We are okay. We're learning how to be secure. And learning how to be secure is when there is no fear. You know why? Because you're in his grip. You're in his hands. Nobody's going to take you and remove you from the love of God. No angel, no demon, nothing can stop God. God's on your side. In order for them to get to you, they're going to have to go through God to get to you. So what can man do, the verse said. Now he comes along and he says, and when you lie down, you will not be afraid. Yes, you won't be afraid. Here's how you know. You will lie down and your sleep will be sweet. And when your sleep is not sweet, I'm here to tell you something. You need to stop immediately and give whatever the problem is over to God. Because you haven't yet given it to him. You're still carrying it. Is anybody listening? And the first thing you're going to do is you're going to be a victory. You've got to be secure. One thing on people that have attitude, they are secure in who they are. They may be crazy as can be. But they're secure. That, they think of themselves as like, wow, they're all that. But I want you to know, and they go by you and you say, them people are crazy. But somehow they accomplish stuff. You know why? Because they don't know they're crazy. <laughs> they got that 80% attitude stuff. They got no talent, got no looks, got nothing. Yet they come out on top. Why? Because they got an attitude. Our attitude isn't about ourselves and how cocky we are. Our attitude is how great he is. And the first thing you and I have got to come to is a place of secure. Are you listening to me? Every person that's ever been used by God in the scripture, you will find they were secure in God in order to keep on going because they were tested all the way along the line. Trials and pressures and problems came upon all the way along the line, all the time. So we're talking about Christian attitude for victory. Number one, you got to be secure. Number two, you got to believe this. It's faith. You're going to have to get to a place, so am I, where we're going to have to believe God. God said it, that settles it. We believe God that the same God that's on my side that secures me, the same God that spoke in planets exists, the same God that raised the dead, opened the blind eyes, opened the mouth of the deaf, listen, opened the ears of the deaf, spoke, the same God that walked on the water, same God that fed the multitudes, the same God that makes creative God, who speaks to the storms, be still, and they are still. This same God is the same God that is backing me and making me secure, and I believe him. If you don't have faith in him, who do you have your 80% in? You've got to have faith in him. He's almighty God and there's nothing, 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 nothing can stop him. And the question is, where are you? You're supposed to be where? In him. You're not by yourself looking outside waiting for him to come. You're in him. He's in you. My goodness sakes alive. Nothing can stop you. Faith. I've said this verse a hundred times to you. I'll say it a hundred more times, maybe a thousand. If you stick around. Hebrews eleven six says it like this. But without faith, it's impossible to please God. Remember, some people come along and say, well, it's 100% God, nothing me. Well, when you got saved, it was 100% God, yes. That's how redemption worked. Jesus went to the cross by himself. But did you know you had to believe that in order for it to work in your life? You had to put your heart, you had to put your life into it. It didn't just happen. There was nobody waved a magic wand over you and you all got saved. You had to get in it with him and had to believe it. Somebody says, well, well there's, I don't have to do anything. Jesus did it all. Yeah, when it comes to redemption, but everything else, you're in works with him. Are you hearing me? You're in partnership with him. He says, for he who comes to God must believe that he is. Believe he is what? God. If I'm going to come to God, i got to believe it every day. I'm not alone in this. 
I don't know how it's going to work. I don't know where it's coming from. I don't know how I'm going to make it. Guy, I'm just not smart enough. I'm not cool enough. I, I, I'm not classy enough. You've got to be kidding. I'm like 800 years old. How am I going to make it? I'll tell you how I'm going to make it. It's God. Never has been me. Even when I thought I was cool, which, by the way, 100 years ago, I thought that. But I want you to know something it has absolutely nothing to do with that. It has to do with God. And if you're believing that the very thing that you need to be victorious is God, you're going to be a winner. If you're believing the very thing you need is that God's going to give you something, forget it. You don't need anything but God. He doesn't have to give you anything. He's already given you everything when you got Jesus. Everything you're ever going to need is called Jesus. Holy Spirit dwells on the inside of you. That's why he says all things are possible to him who... Let me try it again. About 10 of you understood that. Let's say it all out aloud together. Come on. All things are... All, so all things... Oh, 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 oh. Not some things, not few things, not once in a while things. All things are possible to him that who what? Believes. See, I, I've got to get in faith about this. This is not me doing it. The 80% or the 98% or whatever percent it is you're putting in called attitudes, Christian attitude, has got to be, pff, I don't know how I'm going to make it. That's what makes this exciting. What makes the adventure so exciting is you don't know how you're going to make it. Somehow God opens doors no man can open and closes doors no man can close. He takes a nothing, makes something out of it. He takes a failure, makes a success. He takes a sick, makes them heal. Takes a one that can't walk, makes them walk. Takes a broke, makes them rich. Takes one that, oh my goodness, that's our God. He's great and mighty and marvelous and powerful God dwells on the inside of you. The world says you're a failure, but God keeps crying out, you're not a failure. You're a child of God. You're a king's kid. Come on. If we're going to have a Christian attitude for victory, we need to be secure. And number two, we need to have faith. Number three, we need to have diligence. This is not just a little bit, you know, dabble, do you? Tried it once, can't gonna fail. I don't know how many people I've seen come through this church, they're all turned on for about a year. Then the devil slaps them right in the butt, man. All of a sudden they're gone. I tried that. I I been there, done that. Remember that old saying from years ago? Been there, done that. Oh, stupid, you shouldn't have been there and done that. You should have stayed with that. You know what I'm talking about? It's like, oh, well, I tried. You're not supposed to try God. You're supposed to do God. That's your problem. You don't try God. Where does it say try God? You don't try God. You do God. God is either yay or nay. He's either yes or no. If you're going to make him yes, then get into it. Is anybody listening? I'm getting real Pentecostal on you tonight. That's because I haven't been in the pulpit for a couple of weeks. I'm, I'm ready to go. I'm waking up in the middle of the night shouting at everybody. <laughs> Diligence is something, man, you just keep on going no matter what stuff comes at you. You know the old saying from years ago, stuff happens? You know what I'm talking about. Huh? I don't care what kind of stuff hits you. And I don't care who throws it. You just keep on keeping on. Because people that are in victory are people that keep on keeping on. You think about it for a minute. Just stop and think about all their Bible examples. Let's just pick one out. Hey, Joseph. I mean, this guy is a young boy. His brothers betray him, throw him down in a well. Now, I can understand their sibling problems. The kids fight all the time. Big kids pick on the little ones. I understand all of that. I was a little boy. My big brother beat me up all the time, poked me all the time, made fun of me all the time. I understand that, and I, I think I've forgiven him. <laughs> Not sure. 
The point being is, is, yeah, I understand that. But these people threw him down a well, dragged him up and sold him to slavery and told the dad he was dead. Broke the heart of the father. I mean, can you imagine rejection? Some of you have been rejected by families and rejected by relatives. But here's your own brothers. This is the only thing you've ever known in your entire life. They just sold you into slavery. You're going off in some foreign country in some foreign language. There you work hard to stay alive. Talk about diligence. Then the, his boss's wife comes in and accuses him of trying to hustle her. He wouldn't do it because he was a man of integrity and had his eyes and his heart fixed on God. So instead of him getting a reward and patted on the back, they throw him in prison year after year. Can you imagine what an Egyptian prison looked like in those days? I'm going to tell you, they did not have weight rooms. <laughs> they didn't have them. They didn't have television rooms. They didn't have times where they walked in the yard and played sports and did all that stuff. you got to be kidding. This is an Egyptian prison. When they went poop, they went on the floor. When they went pee, they went on the floor. And you lived with it. You breathed it every day of your life until it finally got to you and killed you. And if you died, they dragged you through that stuff and threw you in a hole and buried you and didn't care about you a bit. And what did he do to get there? Nothing. But yet what happens? He is diligent because he knows he's secure in God. It isn't coming to pass today, but it will come to pass in the future. And he stays in there and he keeps on keeping on. you got to be kidding me. All of us that are in here need to remember these stories in the Bible are there. They're not history lessons. They're telling us about having an attitude of victory. He finally gets to the place where he becomes from the prison to the palace and becomes the prime minister over all of the wealth of the Egyptian pharaoh. And he's the one who saves the very family that threw him in the well. My goodness, what a story. All because he was secure. All because he had faith. And all because he was diligent. He didn't give up because there was a little problem. Didn't get up because he messed up. Didn't get up because everybody turned against him. Didn't get up because there was pressure. Didn't get up because someone didn't like him. Didn't get up because things didn't go his way. Didn't get up because he didn't think God was there. He knew it. He knew God was there. And he was diligent. Are you listening to me? We're talking about these five characteristics of victory. The attitude of victory. Proverbs, the 13th chapter, verse 4, says, It's the soul of a lazy man desires and has nothing, but the soul of a diligent shall be rich. Diligence. I mean, if you just took nothing else but were diligent, you'd be rich just off of that, according to the promise of God. You add security to that. You add faith to that. Who I'm talking about being really successful. Successful in your marriage, you know you want it. Successful in being happy in life, and you know you want it. Successful in being fulfilled in life, and you know you want it, or you wouldn't be here today. So cut out the bull, and let's say it like it really is. You want to be successful in every area of your life, and I'm telling you, here's what the Bible says for you to be successful. And all it's going to take for you is a little bit of attitude. Attitude number one, that you're secure in Jesus. Nobody's taking you away. Number two, you got that faith in him. He's a God that cannot and shall not and will not fail. And number three, you're going to keep on going and keep on keeping on no matter what anybody says. Because you're diligent. Number four, Christian attitude for victory. Ready? Here it is. This is the one I hate. I hate this one. I hate it. I wish it wasn't in the Bible. Number four, if I got your attention. Yeah. I'm not going to tell you because I hate it so much. All right, I'll tell you. Oh, I hate this word. Patience. I want it now. I don't want to wait. You know why I don't want to wait? Because I'm really insecure. 
You know why I want, don't want to wait? Because I really don't have faith. You know why I don't want to wait? Because I'm really not diligent for very long. <laughs> Isn't it amazing how the Word of God just exposes all kinds of stuff you don't like? I mean, I can hardly wait to go to some other church. <laughs> Patience. Patience means I'm waiting on God. Doesn't look like anything's happening. Doesn't even look like he's listening. Hello? I'm here. I got up today. I have prayed, heard nothing. I've asked, got nothing. Are you there? <laughs> patience. You know why God wants us to have patience? Because patience shows where we're really at with God. Whether we're really secure, listen, whether we're really in faith, patience shows whether or not we're really going to be diligent. Patience exposes who we are. My thing lately is with God. Here's my prayer lately. You want to know what my prayer is lately? My prayer is probably different than your prayer. God. Oy vey. I am running out of time. Do you know how old I am? And you want me to have patience? I don't want patience right now. I want it now. Let some of the young people learn how to have patience. That's my prayer. Because the older you get, the more you feel like you're out of time and the more you want it right now. Is anybody listening? Everybody that's over 50 say amen. amen. Patience is a terrible word. And the Bible talks about it all the time. But patience shows where you're at. I mean, stop and think about it. Patience. Caleb. God says, take the promised land. He's a young man, 40 years old. He goes out as one of the 12 spies comes back with Joshua and says, hey, we can take the promised land. God said so the other. Remember how the 10 spies came back and said, forget it. There's giants in the land. We can't have it. He waits for 40 years for everyone to die. He's 85 years old, and now he gets his promised land. I always said that when I read that, I said, God, that is so cool, but I don't want to wait until I'm 85 to get it. I don't want somebody pushing me up in a wheelchair to get it. You know what I'm saying? I want to get it while I can walk up and enjoy it myself. I want to do some snow skiing now, God, you know? So that's my problem lately, but that's where patience is. Patience is an amazing word. Hebrews 10 chapter, just pop it up on the overhead. 30, verse number 36 says, for you have need. The, the original translation says patience. This New King James sometimes is probably more right in the translation, but it but it's, doesn't get you the whole point. You have need of patience or endurance, so that after you have done the will of, after you have done the will, after you have done, see, God's waiting to see if you're going to do the will of God. So after the will of God, then, you know, you'd receive the promise. But first you've got to do the will of God, and therefore patience has to be done in order for you to do the will of God. Fascinating. James 1 and 4 just popped up on the overhead for us. Says these words, but let patience have her perfect work. Do you ever notice that patience works something perfect inside of us? That you may be perfect and complete. I would love to be perfect and complete. How many of you look at me right now and realize that Pastor Jim is a perfect and complete person? Not one of you. Okay, church is dismissed. <laughs> That's the way it is, of course. Because here's why. Let patience have her perfect work. That you be perfect. How would you like to be perfect and complete? Listen to this. 
lacking, one translation says, wanting nothing. <laughs> Isn't that what this is all about? Wait a minute, lacking nothing. Isn't that what you work for to get all kinds of stuff? Every day, eight hours a day, 40 hours a week, you bust it, man. You put up with so many people and their bad attitudes and their bad personalities. The boss that pushes you around, the guy that is a, uh, you know, kisses up and gets all everything and he doesn't do half the work. Are you kind of like frustrated about all of this? My Bible says right here, listen to this, you lack nothing. You'll have everything you ever wanted if you just let patience have her perfect work. And that's not easy, but patience says where you're at. Four things. Secure, faith, diligence. We're talking about an attitude. This was the 80% you put in. And we're talking about patience. And the last one is a quick one. Number five, Christian attitude for victory. Never, never, never give up. You give up, you lose. And so many people try for a while and give up. You don't have to give up. You hang in there. Can you imagine David if he gave up? He'd have never been king over Israel. Can you imagine Paul on the road to Damascus having an experience with God, blinded off of his steed, all of a sudden saying, I give up, I quit. Can you imagine Jesus coming to the planet and the Pharisees and the scribes cursing him out and calling him names and ridiculing everything he did? They put a bad name on it, called him the devil, my goodness sakes. And he just said, hey, forget it. I've had enough problems. I'm going to give up. Our problem in the Christendom of the church in America is what we give up too easy. When we got a God and all of his Bible, every person that's ever done anything has never given up. You don't give up. Okay, so you blew the diet. Don't give up. Every day I get up and get back on the diet. You know why I'm wearing these jeans? You want to know the truth? I mean, I got some fine slacks. I can't get in them. Mm hmm. I mean, I got some fine slacks I bought a month ago. <laughs> Mama bought them for me. I can't get in. I'm wearing these jeans because the only thing I can get in. I mean, it's disgusting. You want to see something disgusting? Look at yourself sideways in the mirror. <laughs> Don't look straight on because you can't see the projections. You look sideways. Oh, I'm talking about disgusting. I'm talking about instantaneously giving up just by what you look like instead of who God is. Nobody said you had to look good to be successful, but you never give up. You give up, you quit, you lose. You don't give up. What if David gave up? What if Paul gave up? What if James, John? Let me talk to you about the disciples. Every single one of them lost their lives according to tradition. Can I tell you something? If nothing else tells you the Bible, Jesus is true, that ought to tell you Jesus is true. You know why? Because you would not get those men to lay their lives down one after another for a lie. They would have backed off and said, well, you know, we were just trying to put together a religion. And I don't want to die over some falsehood. Every one of them died for what they knew to be true. That in itself proves the deity of Jesus. <sighs> Guys, listen to me. Not one of them backed off to their life. You don't give up. Yeah, things are tough. Yeah, pressure's on you. Yeah, people curse you. Yeah, people are out to get you. No doubt about it. But there's no problem you'll ever have that isn't common to man. And the Bible says God gives you a way of escape. That's the good news. And the way, you heard it tonight. Secure in him. Faith in him. Psh, diligence with him. Patience in him. But never, never, never give up. 
If God spoke to you tonight, come on, give the Lord a great big praise. You hear that? Hallelujah. Just want to make sure everybody's all right. I was just thinking about the music ministry. When you come and you say to them, look, I got 80% attitude and 20% giftings. <laughs> I'm not sure that's going to work with the, with the music ministers. Remember, we took that to the spiritual end. It was, well, anyway, um, so you got to have some kind of ability to play an instrument. I remember one time I saw a guy named Jimmy Swaggart play the piano and sing, and I said, that is phenomenal. Okay, God, here I am, sat down on the piano. i am tell you a true story. I was just a young Christian in my early 20s. Sat down at the piano and said, okay, Lord, if you can do that for him, you can do that for me. And I want you to know something. How many of you believe I played the piano and sang just like him? <laughs> Nobody, because you're absolutely right. It was like screeching cat. It's like somebody grabbed a cat on the tail. Oh, it was terrible. And screech and shouted, shouted terrible. Hey, let's get saved tonight. Some of you are not right with God. Some of you have never given God all of your heart, never given God all of your life. Listen to me. You can't get saved because you're a nice person. Listen. You can't get saved because you're a good person. You can't get saved because you call yourself a Christian. You're not a real Christian because you say you're a Christian. Or your mom and dad had you christened or baptized when you were a baby. You can't get saved because, you know, uh, you go to church once in a while. I said, what are you talking about? You, you can't do that. That's not how you get saved. If you're going to get saved, you're going to have to get saved Jesus' way. Jesus said, I'm the way the truth and life. No man goes to the Father except by me. You can't get there your way, my way, or some well-meaning church committee's way. And what we've done in America, we've done this, you know, I mean, it's like whatever you think is okay, and you know, this is land of the free, whatever you think is okay, you know, we're all independent thinkers, so you're okay. Forget that. You're not going to make it. And somebody needs to love you enough respect you enough and tell you the truth. You're not going to make it. The way to get saved is only one way, and the Bible tells us, Jesus himself, John 3rd chapter, he says, you must be born again. I don't care how many, you go to church as a child, you can sit there all your years, you can go to catechism class, Sunday school, Sabbath school class, you can have a cross, St. Christopher around your neck, you can have all of that all your life, you can have bumper stickers on your car, you can have a belt that says in him, t-shirts that say I, I, he's in me, you can have all that stuff and still die and go to hell if you're not born again. Bottom line, I didn't say this guys, Jesus said it. You must be born again. Jesus himself said it. He didn't have to say it. He said it. And it's recorded in Scripture so you and I can find out how it is that we get to heaven. You must be born again. Here's what born again means from the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible. It means you've given God all of your heart, given God all of your life. You know why you've got to give it to him? Because he's not a thief to rob it from you. It's your heart and it's your life. He's not a conniver to talk you out of it. He's not a manipulator to take it from you. Stop and think about it. Jesus, who created the heavens and the earth, are you going to tell me he couldn't create trillions of robots to worship him and sing songs to him and bow down to him? Of course he could. He didn't want a robot to do that. He gave you a free will choice. And in that free will choice, you've got to give God all of your heart. You've got to give God all of your life. Now listen to what I'm going to say to you. It's an all or nothing relationship with Jesus Christ. Always has been. Always will be. I'll prove it to you. I'll prove it. I'll prove it. I'll prove it. Last book in the Bible, book of Revelation, Jesus is speaking. He says, I'm coming again. And when I come, I better find you hot or I better find you cold. Because if I find you lukewarm, I will vomit you from my mouth. That's a gross, harsh, hard thing to say. But he said it. I'll vomit you from my mouth. If you're lukewarm, I'm coming again. I better find you hot. I better find you cold. But if I find you lukewarm, he says, I'll vomit you from my mouth. Do you know what he just really said? People, listen to this. Here's what he really just said. People who call themselves Christians that are lukewarm are going to get rejected by God and vomited from the mouth of Jesus. Oh, my goodness. That's a shock. Jesus said it himself. 
Now listen, let me tell you what lukewarm is so you can see if it fits. Little in, little out. Little up, little down. Token prayer, occasional church attendance. You're not against God, but you're not wholehearted for God. God is something in your life, but he's not everything. He's just something. Today is your day of salvation. God brought you. You have a divine appointment to get saved today. And you're going to have to give God all of your heart, give God all of your life. You say, Pastor Jim, how do I do that? Let's do it God's way. Jesus said, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father. In other words, if you confess me before a man, I'm a man. I'm going to see you do this in a moment. He says, I'll confess you as mine before my Father. And then he goes on to say, but if you deny me, if you deny me before men, I'll deny you before my Father. I, I don't know him, Father. He'll say, go for me, a worker of iniquity. I know you not. That's what the scripture says. Wow, you do not want to hear those words. And today, for some of you that are in here, this is your day of salvation. You're going to have to give God all of your heart. You're going to have to give God all of your life. It's an all or nothing relationship. He won't steal it from you. He's not a thief. He's not a conniver to talk you out of it or manipulator to make you do it. You're going to have to give it to him yourself. You're going to have to raise your hand. You say, Pastor, if I have to raise my hand, I'll be embarrassed if I raise my hand. Somebody will see me. Uh-huh. Hopefully God sees you. But who cares what men see? I mean, what would you, what, you, you, you're more afraid of what men think about you than God sees in you? You're, you're more willing to go to hell forever and ever and ever because you're afraid of men? Come on, let's be secure by giving God all of our heart and giving God all of our life. And tonight is your night to give it all to him, all of your heart, all of your life. God brought you here for this reason. Be born again, headed for heaven, denying your presence in hell. I'm going to count to three. I'll go like this. One, two, three. And I'll go bang. When you hear that sound, bang. Your hand goes up. I'll see your hand go up all over this place, back in the family rooms. I'll see your hand go up wherever you're at. You're raising your hand. Here's what you're saying. I don't want to go to hell. I want to go to heaven. I want to be born again. I want to give God all my heart, give God all my life. That's what you're saying. Listen, I already know you know who Jesus is in your head. But you can't get to heaven by who you have in your head. The devil knows who Jesus is. He's not going to heaven. So the fact that you celebrate Christmas and Easter doesn't make you a Christian. It's what you've done with your heart, all of your heart and all of your life. It's your call, your choice in the safe and friendly place. Tonight, it's your night. I'm counting to three now. I've been running from God instead of to God. I'm speaking to you. Get ready to put your hand up. Never given him all of your heart? Get ready to put your hand up. If you've never given him all of your life, get ready to put your hand up. If you're one of those people that are saying to yourself, I'm not sure, make sure. Give him all of your heart and life tonight. Tonight is your night. Are you ready? Here it is. One, two, three. Let me see your hands. Let me see your hands. There's one. Thank you. There's two. Thank you. Three, four, five. Thank you. Back here. Six. Thank you. God bless you. Seven, eight. Thank you. Nine, ten. Thank you. God bless you. Anybody else on this side? 10, anybody else? There's 11, God bless you. There's 12, there's 13 back over here in that family room. God bless you. Anybody else? Real quick, there's 13 wise people. Anybody else? If you're, if you're in this place, you're saying, I wonder if I should do this. You should. Anybody else? Anybody else? There's 13, I already got you guys back in the family room. Put your hand up. Anybody else? Anybody else? Anybody else? Anybody else? Anybody else? Oh, you're gonna miss it. Thank you, there's one right there. Is that okay, mom? Yeah, cool. Anybody else? Anybody else? There's 14 wise people. There's another one somewhere over here. Wave at me. So, oh, there you are. Okay, gotcha, 14. Hey, if there's 14, I feel there's 15. Come on, where are you, 15? You know you need to get your hand up, but you're not doing it. Stop it and get your hand up. Come on, get your hand up. Where are you, 15? Anybody? Real quick. Anybody? Anybody? Where are you, 15? Well, let's give the Lord a great big praise for 14 wise people. Here's what I want you to do. All 14 of you, all 14 in family rooms, hear me now. I want you to get a hold of your coat, purse, sweater, Bible, friend in the family room, bring your kids. It's okay, help them ushers out of the family rooms. And all of you that raised your hands and anybody that didn't raise your hand, you know you should have. I want you to get in the aisle, meet me in front. Now listen to this, listen to this. No one leaves during this period of time. It's rude for you to leave when we're trying to get people to come forward. You're going out the back door. That's just not nice. 
You just wait a few minutes. We'll dismiss you in just a few minutes. All 14 of you, get out of your seat. And anybody that should have raised their hand, let's stand and welcome them. You come right now. Come on. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. Lord, I give you my heart. I give you my soul. Come on, come on, come on. And I live for you. Alone. Hurry, hurry, hurry. Because every breath that I take, every moment. Come on, you come too. Hurry, don't miss this. Come on. Just get out of your seat. Come. The whole family coming. Give them a hand as they come. Thank God, thank God, thank God, thank God. Isn't God good? Well, praise the Lord. Thank God you guys have come. We're excited. Are you guys coming? All right, cool. Let's give them a hand as they come. More people. More fellows in the ship makes fellowshipping more fun. Oh, great. All of you, thank God you have come. This, I want you all to look to your left. See this guy waving at you? His name is Pastor Dave. Pastor Dave, see the hat in his head? He's going to take up a special collection from you tonight <laughs> by passing the hat. No, 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 I'm only kidding. I'm only kidding. I'm only kidding. Pastor Dave's going to do three things. He's going to pray with you to invite Jesus into your heart. Secondly, he's going to give you some free information to take home about what to do next. And then thirdly, he's going to introduce you to a program we have that will help you get strong called Spiritual Personal Trainers. Let us help you get strong in Jesus. Instead of just coming forward, getting you know saved, making that cry to Jesus, and then going off doing your own thing, never living the victory, never living successful, never living fulfilled lives, let us show you how to do this. Is that okay? It only takes a few times. He'll explain to you how it is, and it, only, and it works. Remember, you're going to give God all of your heart. You're going to give God all of your life. Let us help you to do that. Make a left turn. Follow Pastor Dave right over this way. Come on, let's give the Lord a great big praise.